There we go. Hi, everybody. I am sorry. I really care about being on time, but all of my different browsers were giving me problems. So give me just a second here because I had to move to my phone, but that means I won't be able to see our discussion. So I'm just going to make sure I can watch it live. There we go. Okay, so I know y'all can see me because I could see it on my laptop. So thank you so much to Linda for having me here today. I think, uh, here we go. Okay, good. I think I should be able to see comments now. Thank you so thank much you for having so me. Thank you so much to Linda for having me here today. I think, uh, here we go. Um, I'm so excited to be here. She has always been such a wonderful supporter and does great things for books. And so thank you for, for asking me to be here. I want to make sure, okay, y'all can all, um, all hear me. Uh, so I'm author Camille DeMaio. And if I am a new author for you, I write historical fiction. And uh, it is primarily based around the lives of strong women. Uh, they are either fictional or in the case of my newest book, we'll talk about uh, she was a real life woman. Uh, but even with my fictional characters. I love to place them in real settings and really explore the struggles of the day and how they overcame. As the mom of three girls and one boy, I really care about understanding where, uh, the history and how it's linked to today and how we can go forward and also appreciate a lot of what we have. So um, my books are female-centric, very strong women, and so I was especially excited to uh, learn this very obscure story, which I'm going to share with you shortly. Uh, see the comments. Hi to Cheryl, Carla, Lysha, Carol, Lisa, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. So the book I'm talking about is The First Emma. This came out about two weeks ago, and this is my fifth book. Kind of funny enough, it came out on May 5th, which is Cinco de Mayo. De Mayo is my last name, and it's my fifth book. Um, and it is set in San Antonio, my hometown, which celebrates Cinco de Mayo in a really big way. So that was just completely coincidental that all of those things lined up the way they did. Um, but it's uh, that's fun. Uh, Nancy says, I'm a historical fiction junkie. Well, good. If you haven't read my books, I hope you'll check them out. So speaking of strong women, uh, the first Emma... Uh, in an, I'm just going to read you the back of the book because I have never perfected the art of the elevator pitch. <laughs> um, the first Emma is the true story of Emma Kaler, whose tycoon husband Otto was killed in a crime of the century murder by one of his two mistresses, both also named Emma, and her unlikely rise as CEO of a brewing empire during Prohibition. When a chance to tell her story to a young teetotaler arises, a tale unfolds of love, war, beer, and the power of women. Rena says it's on her TBR list. Thank you. So like I said, this is my first about a real life woman. And I really hope to explore that again. It's been um, it's been quite a process uh, with the research. I can tell you on that about that later if you care to know it. Um, but I was inspired because San Antonio, I'm a fourth generation San Antonian and uh, even though I grew up in Denver, we used to go back to San Antonio every year and we would drive down the highway because my dad always, always wanted to visit the Alamo. He was really nostalgic for the Alamo. So we'd drive down this highway to go to downtown and on our right was this very dilapidated but beautiful old building, which I knew to be a former brewery. And later in my adult life, I lived in San Antonio again for 16 years, and I got to watch this amazing part of this part of town become something really amazing to go from nothing to being the absolute crown jewel of the area. Uh, there's a farmer's market, boutiques, and everything, but the the main building of this area was the old dilapidated brewery. So when I started to see construction happening, and then I saw these black painted letters go up on it called Hotel Emma, I knew they were doing something really special. So when I went on opening day, I was blown away. This hotel was named one of the best new hotels in the world by Condé Nast. It was spectacular in the way that they uh, combined the brewing architecture with the hotel. And so my question as a writer, because we're question askers, was who is this Emma of Hotel Emma to have such a place named after her? So when I learned her story about her husband's murder, about his two mistresses named Emma, and about her taking over his brewery, doubling the business, being hit with prohibition, uh, surviving prohibition, she was one of the only 
brewers in the country to survive prohibition because of a lot of the innovative things that she did that actually still remain with us today. So I wanted to pluck this woman out of obscurity because even San Antonians didn't know who she was and share her story with the world. Um, Cheryl starting it this weekend. Jenny just got on. Hi, Jenny. Good to see you. So kind of in a nutshell, that is what inspired me to, to write this one. I will tell you that I almost checked it though, because a lot of what I just told you is most of what is even available to know about Emma. A lot of what is out there about her has simply been lost to history. There are no journals, there are no books about her, there are barely any articles about her, nothing at the time that I could find whatsoever. So the research process was so unusual. If you've read my other books, you know that I care about the research so very much. And when that happened, when I was really stuck to be able to write a whole book the way I wanted to, I really did almost chuck it. And then I thought, we have way too many women's stories lost to history because we know too little about them. So I would rather share you with you what I did learn, which was so inspirational, than to let her just um, continue to be to be lost in that way. So this is what this is a uh, me pushing forward among doubt. Although if you talk to authors anytime, I think all of them have doubt all the time about everything they're writing. That was just the doubt for this book is that I didn't have enough research. Rena says, I want to visit San Antonio ever since I heard the bridge was bought on the ship from pieces as Le from London as the poem goes. I don't know if that if that's in San Antonio. I've never seen that. I thought that was out in Arizona somewhere. Um, but I could be wrong. Maybe it moved. That would be really neat, though, wouldn't it? I've always thought that song was interesting. Uh, Carol, hello, and Jackie, your book sounds amazing. Thanks for much. Good. Thank you for putting it on your wish list. Um, so... I wanted to tell you, and feel free to jump in with questions, so I'm going to just tell you what I think you might like to hear, but I certainly would love to answer your questions too. So there I was, I was ready to chuck this book, and then I realized that part of what I love about writing historical fiction is the way that the modern woman can identify with the historical woman. And so I thought, I need a bridge character to do this, to, to be able to flesh out an entire story. So I ended up setting the book in 1943, which is the, the last year of Emma's life. And I created a fictional character named Mabel. And she has really had so much happen to her because of the war. She has a Me Too moment with her boss before Me Too was ever hashtag or before hashtags were ever hashtags. And she just needs to get out of Baltimore and start a new life for herself. So this opportunity to come write the memoir of this woman, Emma Kaler, and move to San Antonio comes up. And she decides, I have nothing to lose. Let me take this. So half the book ended up being this Mabel Hartley fictional character, but she is emerging into a world having been hurt in a lot of ways, but it's a world where it was just starting to open up some opportunities for women because so many men were at war that women were able to, um, to take, take those jobs. And so Mabel's at this precipice of being able to do that. So she gets to interact with Emma and gets that inspiration. Um, I saw a few questions there. Um, let me go back. I'm having to scroll on my laptop. Hello from sunny Northern California. I used to live in Northern California. Okay. Um, oh, love your necklace. Where did you get it? Oh, actually, I didn't even realize I didn't put this on on purpose, but it's actually very San Antonio related. So I'm glad you asked the question. Um, this necklace and actually my earrings too come from a San Antonio silver jeweler called James Avery. Check out his website. He makes the most beautiful, amazing creations. And I live in Virginia now, but like I said, I'm a fourth generation San Antonian and this is, this is local for the local girl. So James Avery, little shout out for that. Um, I just, I hope I'm saying that right, Laisha. Um, do you have conversations with your book character? That's a great question. That's actually something that I learned recently. A lot of authors have that. I read an article that said as many as 70% of authors hear their characters' voices or they see a movie in their head as they're writing. And I thought that is such a high number. I can't imagine that 70% of people, of writers experience that. So I put um, a post out on Facebook and sure enough, my writer friend said, yes, they frequently experience that. So I think the number was true. That is not my experience, however. I think in words. Um, so I don't hear my characters' voices. I don't see pictures run through my head. I just, 
I devour words and I like to put them on paper. And so my experience, I guess, is kind of in the minority there, but that's my process <laughs> and that's what works. I kind of wish I did, that would be really neat. Uh, the last book that, I, that came out for me though, um, this is The Beautiful Strangers that came out last year. The first character in this book is the ghost, the real life ghost of the Hotel Del Coronado in California. And I, over, I only ever intended for her to just be in the prologue. And her voice, not like a voice I heard or anything, but just writing her story poured out of me in a way that no character ever has. And so that's probably the closest I've ever come to feeling like something outside of me was really propelling me to tell a story. So I ended up making her story half of the book because I felt so strongly about that character. So that that might be as close as my experience is. Uh, Tracy says, do you dream about your characters? I don't. Um, yeah. Um, I was inspired to write in the beginning because of the Twilight series. And I know that the Twilight series came about because of a dream. And uh, no, that hasn't been my case, too. I think that um, really I'm all about words. And so it doesn't come up for me as dreams or pictures or voices or anything. <laughs> uh, Jackie says, are you writing a new novel right now? Um, I am. So I have one project I'm working on that I can't talk about just yet. I'm waiting for that contract to come through. But the other project I'm working on is called Come Fly With Me. It is set in 1961 and it is about two fictional Pan Am stewardesses. And uh, I, it's also inspired by my love of Frank Sinatra. So I'm having so much fun with writing that book. And I have spent all this quarantine time interviewing a whole bunch of women who had been flight attendants with Pan Am uh, during that time period. So I've been doing a lot of research, a lot of interviews, and I'm so excited to be putting that back on paper soon. So I'm not sure when we'll see that. Maybe it'll be a 2021 book. Um, I did just come uh, in February. I spent all of February in the Pacific. I was in Hawaii for several islands and then uh, Tahiti, Bora Bora, and Mororea doing some book research because a lot of that one will take place in the Pacific. And I was sitting on the beach in Mororea and realized um, I had no pen or paper, which is such a silly thing for a writer. So I grabbed the bag I had, which was a bag that had held some lychee liqueur I bought, and I grabbed a pen and I wrote the beginning of the prologue on the liqueur bag. So there is the beginning of Come Fly With Me right there. <laughs> um, let's see, I want to make sure I'm not skipping anything. Oh, you guys are so awesome with your questions. Um, okay, Cheryl, did you make up the pieces of the story you didn't have? Yes, so back to First Emma. That is a really good question, and thank you so much. As a historical fiction writers, writer, I care so much about the history being accurate, but it is historical fiction, and so we do need to glue it together with fiction. Uh, there's this Japanese art that I can't remember the name of it, but they take broken pottery and they put it back together with gold. And they believe that the gold that binds the broken pieces makes the piece even more beautiful than it was to begin with. And I kind of think of historical fiction as the same way. I put every bit of history in here that I could, but there were some things that were just unknown and I have to fill them in with what I hope is gold. An example of this would be that Emma and her husband Otto did not have any children. And I have no idea. I could not find any record of whether that was by choice or whether they were having fertility issues. Because this was the very early 1900s at the time, I think it's reasonable to assume that they had trouble conceiving because I, it was more cultural than to, to be having children. So I went with the choice of that. And so I have a whole storyline about her struggle and her feelings about infertility. So that's one place where I filled in the gaps. Other times there was just conflicting information. For example, um, I don't think I even told you this yet, but Emma was injured in a car accident in 1910. She was in a wheelchair. So all these other amazing things about her, and then she's doing it from a wheelchair. And that is why they hired the two nurses named Emma to take care of her. And then Otto ended up having affairs with both of the nurses. It's crazy. But uh, I found conflicting um evidence of whether her car accident was in Germany or it took place in the United States. And I found several accounts saying different things. So I just had to make a choice on that. And I chose Germany. So those are other ways I have to fill in with educated guesses. And other times I just have to imagine how did she feel about a certain thing. And I write a scene about how I think she might have felt. Um, so that, that's my process there. 
By the way, today is National Craft Distiller Day, so uh, this is a good day to be talking about a book about beer. Um, let's see, I got that one. So I uh, got that one. Jackie said, if you could write a different genre, what would it be? Um, I wish I could write mystery. My very favorite author of all time is Agatha Christie. And I have read all of her Poirot books and some of them that weren't Poirot, but I've read all the Poirot books. And I have never, ever once been able to figure out who did it because she's so masterful. And yet when Poirot sits there and he talks at the end about all the things that led up to him coming to the conclusion, you realize it was all right there. So she didn't just just drop facts into there at the end. She really made a roadmap, but it was so discreet that personally, I've never been able to figure it out. So I would love to write mystery, but I have such a high expectation for myself being the Agatha Christie lover that I am. And just flat out, I would not be as good as Agatha Christie. So I just don't touch that except as a reader. <laughs> so let's see. Um, Tracy says, I think I would have been a bootlegger. Um, I'll tell you something interesting about Prohibition, and I learned this through researching Emma, and Emma was actually one of the pioneers in this. Um, so obviously you couldn't buy beer, you couldn't buy alcohol, and Emma had to find a way to keep her employees employed. So she co-created, there were a lot of brewers who were talking at the time, including the Anheuser-Busch families, so this is a collaboration really, but she put out a product, a malt product, that was marketed on grocery store shelves as a, a baking ingredient, and you could make bread with this. However, it was widely distributed how to take this very specific malt product and turn it into beer at home, and it was not illegal mostly in that case because it was purchased as a baking product. So there were a lot of people making beer at home from this thing that Emma had a hand in inventing as far as I could tell. And uh, I thought that was pretty clever. <laughs> um, let's see. Jackie says, what are three books you've read and would recommend recently? Oh, uh, let's see. For historical fiction, I have used this quarantine time to get through a trilogy that is 3,000 pages long, um, which is why I have not attached, uh, attacked it before. But it's by Ken Follett and his, his Century Trilogy, and it lasts for almost all of, um, of the 20th century. And it was fascinating. I love Ken Follett. And I'm glad I had the time to finally get to that. Um, another one, it's brand new on the market, completely different, was um, Sorry I Missed You by Susie Krause. That just came out, and it was just a delightful read. Um, it was about three strangers who end up renting in the same house, and a mysterious letter arrives, and they all think the letter might be meant for them. So great premise and really great execution. So that one was Sorry I Missed You. And then right now, I don't think I have it with me. I'm reading uh, The Paris Hours, which is one of the uh, book of the month books from last year. The, the prose is gorgeous. It just takes me into Paris. So I'm really enjoying that. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, Jackie says, oh, Ly Lysha says, Aver James Avery has beautiful jewelry. Yes, shout out to, to him. Um, let's see. Rena says, did you come across any difficulty while researching? Yes. The two big difficulties for researching the first Emma were just the lack of firsthand materials. I did go visit with the hotel historian at the hotel Emma. He put me in touch with the archivist at the hotel. I um, tried to reach out to the community college that uh, owns the mansion that she and Otto had built to see if they had any materials and nobody knew anything about any existing diaries, journals, records, or anything. So just finding that was really hard. And then that other part, like I mentioned, was just conflicting information on quite a number of things where I just had to make my best choice based on seeing two different things. Um, Jenny says, I loved Mabel. Thank you. I, I really am glad the story worked out the way that it did. A, I'm glad I didn't chuck it. And B, I'm uh, thankful for the inspiration to have written Mabel as a character because she ended up really, really being the bridge between the modern reader and Emma. So I... I try to give thanks. I'll just tell you my favorite Bible verse is Thessalonians, give thanks in all circumstances. And I apply that to everything in my life, even when things don't go my way. I try to remember give thanks in all circumstances because it usually works out in a way that you don't expect. And I just try to have faith and trust in that time. And that's one of those things with the book. I was, I was frustrated about not finding the research that I wanted to. But when I did press on, I think it's actually a better book because of having created the character of Mabel. So just another reminder to say thanks in difficult circumstances. Jackie says, who inspires you? 
Uh, probably my biggest inspiration is my Aunt Cheryl. Um, just for so many reasons that I couldn't even elaborate on here fully, but she is somebody who is grace under pressure. She has survived uh, cancer twice, always cheerful, always bold. She went out with her bald head like she didn't care what the world thought about it. Um, I'm so glad she recovered and she's with us. And just for a thousand, thousand reasons, I, my Aunt Cheryl is, is my most inspiring person. Um, what do I do in my free time? I read a lot. And <laughs> now I get to kind of say that I get paid to read, not only because it, it feeds my writing, really. I read 110 books last year, which I think is okay for um, for having four kids and my husband working at home. Uh, we, we homeschooled our kids. Uh, two are off in college now and two are still at home. So in my free time, I'm not. And besides that, I am a travel addict. I love to travel so much. I have had seven different things canceled due to all of this right now. Um, so I miss those trips, but I, I love to travel. I love to go to movies and bake and farmer's markets. I think I'm pretty simple, but I love all of those. I will say regarding travel, all of my books are inspired by places. So a lot of authors will start with character or they'll start with plot. My books start with a sense of place. So the Hotel Emma um, started with seeing the brewery and the hotel and learning about that. I'll just run you through these. The Beautiful Strangers is set at the Hotel Del Coronado in California. So in 2016, my husband and I were walking the beach there, and he said, you love this place, you should write about it, and that became that. This is The Way of Beauty, and as you can tell from the skyline, it is set in New York City. It is about the um, building of Penn Station. The original Penn Station was an incredible, glorious building. They dug the tunnels under the two rivers, brand new technology to be able to do that. And so this is the saga of three women through the generations interacting with this really remarkable train station. This is Before the Rain Falls. And... Um, this is also set in Texas at a Texas women's prison. In this case, it wasn't that um, that location that inspired me, but the idea to write in Texas did inspire me for this. And I learned a lot about Texas prisons in the 1940s, which was really fascinating. And then this is my original, my debut, The Memory of Us. It takes place in Liverpool and London, and it is inspired by the Beatles song, Eleanor Rigby. So I imagined who was Eleanor and who was Father Mackenzie and what was their history. In the end, the names changed, but nothing else changed except that. So if you're a fan of Eleanor Rigby and you read this book, you'll definitely be able to see that it was um, inspired by those characters. And I had a chance in 2014 when Paul McCartney came through San Antonio, I was able to go to a concert and uh, tell him that I had written this book. It was a manuscript at the time and he asked for a copy. So I gave it to him and he called me up on stage, brought the book to the mic and started reading it to the audience. So one of the best moments of my life. Hope you'll check out the memory of us. So let me um, catch up on these. Jackie says, when did you become a writer full time? Um, the, before the rain falls was really the instigator of that. Um, not that it was a bestseller. I mean, it, it did well. In fact, I just got an email from my publisher last week that I hit the 50,000 mark on this one. So I'm really um, grateful and excited for that. But this, I was a full time realtor at the time and homeschooling my kids and writing and breaking down because of all of that. It was too much. And I really had to say something has to be on the plate. I wanted to continue to homeschool the kids. I wanted to keep writing. And as much as I love my real estate career, of all the things, it's the one that I felt I could let go of. And I really had support from my husband to do that. It was a giant pay cut to do that and to start out with that. But I really had his support and it has been completely rewarding. And I'm very grateful to be able to, to do that with my time. Um, oh, gosh, there's so many comments. I'm trying to catch up. Let's see. Thank you all. You are awesome. Um, let's see. Oh, where in Northern, Northern California did you live? I'm in Sacramento. I lived in South San Francisco, uh, Burlingame, and San Mateo over the course of four years. Uh, my husband and I moved there right after um, we were married. He's from Millbrae. His parents are still in Millbrae. And uh, we had our first two kids in Redwood City. So it's a beautiful area. Um, let's see. Who are your favorite authors or genres? Uh, well, besides Agatha Christie being my favorite all-time author, my favorite um, contemporary, well, not that she writes contemporary, my favorite living author is Kate Morton. She also writes historical fiction. All of her characters are fictional, uh, but her books are amazing and they are elegant and her word choices are poignant and I 
just aspire to write with the beauty that she writes. So if you haven't checked out Kate Morton, I love her books. And my favorite of those is The Secret Keeper. So there's one to add to your TBR list. Uh, Jackie says, I love history. So excited for everything you have coming. Thank you. I have kind of an idea of what I think my next four books will be. One of them will take place in Rome. I used to go to Rome as a child several times with my family, and we stayed at a convent that um, that was run by nuns as a kind of a hotel, a home, home for pilgrims, but it had a um, beautiful history, beautiful building, and I'm going to set a book there. Um, during World War II. So I'm very excited about what's coming up with that. And I have another New York one in mind as well. So we'll see. Uh, Antoinette says she loved the beautiful strangers. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that was my most fun book to write. And I think I didn't say this when I was talking about the beautiful strangers. It does take place at Hotel Dell, like I said, but there is the Hotel Ghost, which was the original inspiration for the story. But the other part is that the movie Some Like It Hot with Marilyn Monroe was filmed there. And so this book takes place on the set of Some Like It Hot. So it's a lot of fun to research. Tony Curtis, Jack Lemmon, Marilyn Monroe, a number of the things I put in there really did happen. I read memoirs and, and stories about the set, and I brought those into there. And the really uh, one of the most fun parts, you'll have to read it to see what they did. But the contraption that um, Tony Curtis came up with to try, because they're wearing women's clothes in there, and they had to figure out how to go to the bathroom while wearing hours of women's clothes and heels and all this stuff. And so they came up with a contraption, and it was fun to talk about, or fun to learn about. And I put that in the book. Um, Tracy says, I can't believe the cad had two women by the same name. Well, three women by the same name. He had his wife, Emma, and then he had the two mistresses who were also Emma. So he had three Emmas in his life. I couldn't find any evidence that he had any mistresses beyond that, but at least for there, it seemed to be that Emmas were a thing for him. <laughs> uh, Leslie, I love your enthusiasm. Thank you. You guys are making it easy. You're asking me fabulous questions. Jenny says, other than getting ideas for books from your travels, oh, it just Oh, uh, it just disappeared on me. Oh, do you ever just have an idea pop into your head and lead you to research a topic? Um, that happens occasionally. Um, in some of the future things that I'm thinking, there are a few examples of that. But in general, it is in my travels that I'll go to a place and I find the place interesting. So then I want to learn about the people who populated the place and built the place. And that ends up inspiring it. Um, but I always have ideas. I actually keep it in the notes section of my phone. I have ideas going for when something pops in. Often, though, that will be something that becomes a detail in a book, not usually the instigator for the book itself. Uh, Elisha says, thank you so much for making history fun. It was not one of my favorite subjects. Yeah, I, I like history. I liked history in school. I can't say that I loved it. I just think I'm not a textbook person. I learn better through story. So I didn't even know. I mean, seriously, I was... I had published my first book before I knew that historical fiction was a genre. I read a lot of historical fiction, but I literally didn't know that that was a name for it. And uh, so had a, uh, had a lot to learn on that. Um, so that's how little I knew. But I looked back and realized I loved reading historical fiction all my life. And I think it's because um, I learned something in it. And yet I learned through story. So that's what I ended up doing. Nancy says the paper bag would look cute framed and reminded to bring a pen and paper. Yes, I will try to not be without pen and paper again. And um, I don't, I, I'm not superstitious and I don't believe in jinxing, but there is just something that makes me feel like I'm not going to frame this until I'm done with the book and have it sold um, because I don't know why. I don't know why. I just feel like I want to get the project done and then that'll be my reward is I'll, I'll go to Michael's and pay to have it professionally framed. <laughs> so... Um, Jenny thinks I could rock mystery. You're very generous to think so. I really don't think so. I do try to weave mystery into my books just enough at the end of a chapter to make a reader really want to know what happens next. But as an overall whodunit kind of mystery, uh, Agatha Christie is just just the queen, and I, I feel like I couldn't compare. So um, I'll, I'll let that be her realm. Uh, let's see. Uh, Leslie ha lived in a house on the coast that had a pass through for booze that opened to an alley. That would be so, that would be so great in a book. Lysha says, who's your favorite fairy tale princess? Um, having three daughters, we have gone through all the iterations of princesses for Halloween, for everything. My first two daughters had um, a Cinderella dress and a bell dress that they each wore for everything. Grocery stores, 
everything. Those things were in tatters, but they adored them. Um, but if I had to pick a favorite one, I think um, as much as I would say Belle, because she gets a pretty envious li library in the end, um, Cinderella. Maybe it was just one of my earliest movies, and I've always had just a a soft spot for Cinderella. I think she stays, uh, and part of it is she stays kind in the face of unkindness, and that affected me at a young age. I love that. Um, hi, Anne-Marie. Good to see you. XO back. Elisha said that's a beautiful Bible verse. Yes, give thanks in all things. You don't have to be religious to grasp onto that verse because seriously, it carries me through so much. I just remain thankful and, um, yeah, that carries you through. It keeps you positive. Linda says, what goals do you have after for your readers after they read your books? Great question. So um, I have two favorite comments that I hear from readers. One is that should be a movie. <laughs> Only because I hope, you know, if you know, from your lips to God's ears, I would love that. And so when people feel like they really felt, felt something cinematic out of it, that just delights me. But my other favorite comment uh, really is when somebody tells me that what I wrote about prompted them to go do a deep dive on the internet and learn more. Because that tells me that something that I learned and then wrote about was inspiring enough to you, engaging enough to you to want to go out and learn more. And that's what books are. Uh, you know, it's not meant to be the end and you put it on yourself. If, if it continues, um, I think the story continues then, and to feel like I played a small part in that is very rewarding. So that's my favorite compliment. <laughs> um, Carla loved Mabel. Yes, thank you. I um, I really loved writing her. It was a lot of fun. There's a scene in there, for those of you who haven't read it, where Mabel goes to Walgreens just to get some co pick up some cosmetics. And at the time in 1943, I looked up all these advertisements just to, to do something very realistic with it. And oh my gosh, they were all geared toward this cosmetic will help you get a man. In one way or another, that was the message going through with every advertisement I feel like I found is this is what you use to get a man. And so the fact that this was 1943, and like I said, that precipice of a lot of things changing for women, Mabel is struck by that. She, she, here she knows Emma, who is a widow, who has gone and done many, many things without a man in her life anymore. And yet everything being advertised to Mabel is about the goal being to get a man. So it's this turning point in her life in the Walgreens cosmetic section. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Tracy says four kids in homeschool. I know it sounds, um, that sounds like more than it is. Maybe it's just because we've done it for 17 years. Uh, but we started with one and, you know, we loved our field trips and we loved our time together. And then the second one came along and we just continued. So we never actually sought to do it. We just kind of fell into it and then ended up loving it as a lifestyle. And by the time they hit about fifth grade, there's actually a lot of independence on their part. So at that point, I really shift to just overseeing what they're doing and making sure that um, they're on track. But the sitting and, and teaching um, is a lot less at about the fifth grade level. And then there's so many great resources out there, like Khan Academy was a huge resource to my first daughter for Algebra 2 because mom was not able to teach that. So that was really great that we have great, um, great uh, tools out there for that. Leslie, do you ever sleep? I sleep a little bit more than I used to. When I wrote The Memory of Us, I used to drink Dr. Pepper a lot in order to be able to stay up till about three or four every morning writing. Um, so we had just had our fourth kid. He was in diapers. My husband was super helpful, but that, that was a lot. And so I sacrificed sleep, but that was um, 11 years ago and I could do that. I was a little bit younger. Uh, it's a little bit harder to do now, but um, as my husband will tell you, when my head hits the pillow, I'm out. So I don't sleep a lot of hours, but I tend to get quality sleep. So I manage. Um, Jackie, maybe you can share with us the link to the jeweler. Yes. Let me see if I can close out of here. James Avery should totally give me a, a commission on this or something, but really his stuff is so beautiful. So let me just pop that into there, into the comments. Okay. There's his, uh, oh, it looks like I said it as Linda, but it's me. <laughs> um, so there you go. He's got beautiful stuff. Yeah, I, Leisha, I guess he liked the name Emma, right? Um, love Kate Morton's books, Carla. Yes, they're so fantastic. Um, 
Anne Marie, yes, before the rainfall hit uh, 50,000. Actually, hit a little while ago. I just just got the email about it. Um, Tracy and Leisha say so exciting about Paul McCartney. Yes, that definitely ranks as one of the best moments in my life. Um, my dad passed away in September, um, somewhat unexpectedly. He just went downhill with Parkinson's really, really fast. Um, uh, it was literally like get to the hospital and say goodbye kind of thing. But he was a big Beatles lover and it prompted him to become a, a hobbyist musician. And so he really gave me a love of the Beatles and my dad got to be there with me at that concert and see me bring this to Paul McCartney and it was just full circle. So the Paul McCartney part in itself was really great. The fact that I got to have my dad there, my mom and my aunt Cheryl was just fantastic. So it really, just was one of the best moments ever. Um, Bunny? Yes. Uh, ask the kids. They should know where they are. There's some on the dresser on the, um, like, there's some on the dresser by the front door. They're a little bit flowery, but that's what I've got. It's looking for a mask going out. Um, do you have any hobbies that you enjoy, things you like to collect? I like to collect books. Does that surprise anybody? Let me show you. Oh, sorry, I forgot that I'm on my phone, not my, there we go. Oh, that's upside down. Here we go, clearly not technical. This is my nightstand, so I needed, um, I needed, uh, and then that's next to my nightstand. So that's just one of my bookshelves, I collect those. I will say, oh, there's my, there she is back there. St. Teresa is my favorite saint. So I've got her statue for sure. Um, I collect seashells. I love the beach. One of the reasons we left Texas among others is I wanted to be able to wake up any given morning and say, I'd like to drive to the beach today. And I'm able to do that in Virginia. And so my son and I especially love to collect seashells and we get all sorts of uh, great jars and we put seashells in there. So that's a lot of fun. Um, basically, I'm really not a very materialistic person, not that you have to be materialistic to be a collector of anything, but I really love to collect experiences more than anything. I think that's what I love about travel. And when I travel, I try to treat myself to one little splurge, not big splurge, but a little locally made splurge. And I have no idea going in what it might be, but I want it to be either a little artistic thing, just, uh, you know, when I was in Mora Rea, this was not expensive, but this is just a little tiny painting of Mora Rea that, um, you know, an artist did. So I do collect that. I collect little things from my travels. Um, Rena, I love your energy, Camille. Thank you. I I try to be a joyful person. Um, like I said, Cinderella was an inspiration to me as a young person just about how to be kind in the face of adversity. Uh, you know, at the time you're watching it, you don't realize that's what it's about. But looking back, I realized that was very formative to me. And Anne Shirley and Anne of Green Gables was super formative to me. And um, also uh, Pollyanna. So my husband actually calls me Pollyanna. I play the glad game all the time. So when something's not going my way, I definitely try to find something to be glad about in it. Sometimes it's harder than others. So, you know, don't give me too much credit for that or anything, but I really do try and it, it can keep you in a positive place in a really important way. Um, Carla says, I love Kate Morton's books. I know they are the best. She's my favorite. I got to meet her in Houston when she had a book signing for the Lake House. At the time, I still lived in San Antonio and she's from Australia. So I saw she was in Houston, which is about four hours away. And I thought, I don't know when I'll ever get a chance to see Kate Morton again. And so I went out there. It was a pretty small event, actually. Um, I mean, maybe 20 people for a mega writer like Kate Morton. So I really did get to meet her and I already had the memory of us under contract. I had just days earlier gotten this cover art. And this is the first time I'd ever gone through that. So I was extra super excited. And so I got to show her before I showed anybody else the cover art of the memory of us and to tell her that her writing inspired my writing. And then I broke down and cried because that was, that was uh, really meaningful to me. A little embarrassing, but Tracy, you've had such an interesting traveling life so far. Yes, I, I do love it. I've um, been inside the pyramids in Egypt and um, sailed on the Bosphorus River through Istanbul, where you have Europe on one side of the river and Asia on the other side of the river. Um, you know, Rome, London, Paris. Um, my dream is to go to Thailand. I haven't gotten there yet. I would like to go to Thailand and see the beaches and the animals. So we'll see. I miss travel. Can't wait till we can travel again. Uh, Linda, I love and highly recommend all your books. Thank you so much. You are awesome. I can't do what I do without all of you. Mendy loves Tony Curtis. 
who doesn't love Tony Curtis? Isn't he amazing? He wrote um, an entire memoir just about working on Some Like It Hot. It was a fantastic resource for me when writing The Beautiful Strangers uh, to get inside him. He's a very secondary, very secondary character in that book, uh, but he did have an affair with Marilyn Monroe uh, while they were filming that. And a lot of what he said about Marilyn made its way into the book when I was trying to form her personality. She's also a secondary character, but I wanted it to be um, authentic. Um, I guess, uh, let's see, my mom went to, the, Minty says, my mom went to the same high school as Tony Curtis. Nice. I would love to get the beautiful strangers into Jamie Lee Curtis's hands. I have so much respect for her. She's high on the list of celebrities I'd like to meet someday, and I'd love to tell her that I wrote about her dad in a small way. Diana says, did Emily have a guy, did Emma have a guy friend? Not that I found any record of. That's a great question. So back to the first Emma. All of my books, if you're familiar with them, have a little bit of a romantic thread, some more than others, but that's an important thing too. Um, you know, love is an important life, a part of life. That's how we get here. Um, but Emma, I couldn't find any record that she had any men in her life after her husband was murdered. And so it was suggested to me by somebody along the book industry path that I create a romance for her. But I didn't feel right about that because she was my real character and I just... I didn't want to fictionalize things for the sake of drama. I fictionalized some things for the sake of here's A and here's C and I need a B to be able to put these things together. So I would try to be realistic and imaginative about what that B could have been. But to just say, hey, I need a romance. Let's give her a romance when I had no historical evidence about there. I wouldn't feel right about doing that. So I didn't. However, I have given her a fictional nephew. She had a lot of nieces and nephews and cousins come through Germany. So all the time they were coming through her house. So I just made a fictional nephew and I create a romance for the character of Mabel. And because they're both fictional, they can have their romantic story. So it's still in there, just not about, about uh, Emma herself. Mindy says, nice meeting you. I've heard many great things about your books. Uh, yeah, not a textbook person either. And um, wonderful. I hope you'll read the first Emma and any of my others. Um, I'm really easy to reach out to and uh, tell me what you think. As always, I'll just uh, say for all authors, we really appreciate when you guys um, read one of our books and review it and tell your friends. That means so much. Uh, I think probably only about 1% of, of readers actually go review them. And you would not believe how helpful it is when you do so little shout out when you read my books or any others please do that uh, let's see um, Nancy says do you read your book reviews on Amazon I read my book reviews um, on Goodreads I don't I don't know what it is about Goodreads but it has a universal um, I, I don't know if it just attracts more trolls or something but people on Goodreads are harsh and Amazon, I mean, you get every author has their one and two star reviews and that happens. And, you know, you can't really get worked up about that. And um, sometimes it's deserved. Sometimes you just have to laugh at them. But on, on whole, I find the, the totality of the Amazon reviews and the reviewers it attracts to be a pretty fair assessment of the book on Goodreads. Even when I read the reviews of other writers, I just wonder sometimes if some of the people really active there are maybe jealous or enjoy tearing people down because some of what happens there just doesn't seem founded at all. So I stopped reading over at Goodreads because it just makes you to feel ter I still review on Goodreads. As a reader, I absolutely review on Goodreads. But as a writer, I don't read those anymore. They really just bring me down, not only on my own, but other friends because of that. Um, and, and on Amazon, though, I, I do. Um, you know, you celebrate the five, the four and five stars, of course. I look at the threes and I go, okay, you know, what can I learn from a three? I usually think a three star is usually a pretty measured thing. But the, the ones and twos, sometimes they're just funny. <laughs> sometimes they're just funny. I had um, my first two star review for The Memory of Us was somebody who complained that my character drank chamomile tea because she didn't like chamomile tea and my character drinking chamomile tea ruined the book for her. So those are the ones you just have to laugh about a little bit. Um, uh, let's see. Jenny knew I would pick Cinderella. Really? Because most people would usually think I would pick Belle because of all the books, but... Um, you must know me well. It's Cinderella. Carla, your stories would make perfect films. Thank you. I would love for them to be films. Um, 
in my mind, I've already cast the memory of us because actually that's the one more than any that readers tell me this should be a movie. Um, I have them in the hands of a film agent who is reading them right now. So we'll see if anything happens. I don't have anything in the works, so that's not a teaser, but you know, let's, let's, I'll pray it happens. Mindy says, Tony Curtis was Bernie Schwartz when my mom went to high school, to school with him in New York. Yes, I did read that he was, uh, Bernie Schwartz is his real name. Diana says, do you have a video of Paul McCartney reading out of your book? Yes, my brother made it into a video. He was, I had a very close seat. He was up in the rafters. So my aunt was taking a video. My brother was taking a video. And this all very surprisingly transpired. They got their phones out. And then my brother spliced it together in a really cool little video with both angles. And I posted that back when it happened, October, it was October of 2014 on Facebook. So I'd have to scroll back to that time and find it again. It's really something I should save and probably put on my YouTube page because it was a pretty special moment. Um, I do have photos. I wonder if I can add a photo here because I have a picture of him reading it. I don't think it's going to let me add. Let's see if it does. Yeah, it's not letting me add a photo in the comments, but it was a special moment. I have a really good one of him reading the book. Uh, let's see. Rena says Khan Academy is the best. Oh, they are. That it helps a homeschooler like crazy. It is so interesting to me, side note here, that the world has suddenly had to start homeschooling and working from home because I've homeschooled for 17 years and my husband uh, and I have worked together in the house for probably 14 years. And uh, we went through our process of working that out. That, that That's not always an easy thing, but we tackled that many, many years ago. And so suddenly with the whole world all at once, was suddenly homeschooling and working from home. It was very interesting to observe all of that. Um, I hope that in the end, it gives people some respect for what homeschoolers do. As time goes on, has gone on, um, a lot more people have been very receptive. But when we first started homeschooling, I had a lot of people tell me my kids were going to end up stupid. My kids were going to be unsocialized. If anybody knows my kids, they're not either of those things. They're not perfect. No kid is, but they've turned out well. And, um, I would love to think that in part it's because of a lot of the family time and adventures and travels we've been able to have, but they have been very socialized. That has not been a problem. So I hope that everybody is um, getting a little taste of, of what that life is like. Um, Tracy, so sorry to hear about your dad. Thank you. That has to come sometime. It was just earlier than expected. Linda says, how would you like your readers to connect with you? Um, I'm really easy to find. I'm here on Facebook, uh, but I'm most, I, I love Instagram. It's my favorite format. So if you're over at Instagram, I'm Camille DeMaio underscore author. I'm the only Camille DeMaio I know there, so I should be pretty easy to find. I frequently do giveaways. I often talk about other, I mean, most of my posts are about what I'm reading and about other people's books. I actually have a giveaway next week coming up of Chanel Cleeton's new book, um, The Last Train train to Key West. Uh, she's a good friend of mine. We've had a few opportunities to uh, do some writing together, just laptop to laptop. We weren't writing the same thing, but just to hang out and have writing time. Um, so her book is fantastic. So go follow me at Instagram and you'll see, um, see in the next few days, I'll have uh, the giveaway up for Chanel. So find me there. Also, uh, BookBub always, um, BookBub's a great place. And then finally, YouTube. I've had a lot of videos up on YouTube for a while. Most of them are book reviews. I'll do video book reviews, two minutes. Um, like to keep it short and sweet there. Um, all my book trailers are on my YouTube channel. Uh, but I have used this quarantine time as well to organize my YouTube channel. So I actually have playlists and it actually visually looks good. So you would do me a great favor if you would subscribe to me on, on YouTube. I only post every few weeks. You're not going to get a lot of emails, but um, yeah. Oh, actually, let me think of, I can actually put it right in the comments and make that easy for you. Um, and the other thing I, that my awesome publicist Anne Marie who is on this chat right now has been nudging me for quite a long time to have a newsletter and oh once I do things I can really run with them but the idea of starting something new is often intimidating to me so I finally did it so here is in the comments that is the sign up for my newsletter and that's once a month so you're not going to get inundated there but 
of fun things and giveaways and whatever Anne Marie tells me to do, I'll do because she's a genius. Okay, and here's my YouTube channel. Okay, now that makes them easy to find. So you can find me at all those different places. Um, Jenny says, please repost the video with Paul McCartney. I'll do that. You know what? I was such a baby writer. Actually, I just had the manuscript at the time, and now I have all these readers I'm friends with, and they've never seen that. So I need to go dig it up, and I will do that. So find me on Facebook. I'll put it out there. Um, Dinah says, I wonder if Amazon and Goodreads are associated. Yes, I think Amazon bought Goodreads, but they still have distinctly different feels. And I think that they attract distinctly different readers in many cases. But like I said, as a reader, I always review on Amazon, Goodreads, and BookBub. So I'll put it in those three places. I personally find those as an author that those are the most helpful places that an author or that a reader can post. So that's where I always post for uh, people. Um, Leslie, thank you for speaking about reviews. I don't pay much attention to them. I'm stubborn like that. Yeah, they're, they're interesting. <laughs> um, Lycha, people always have something negative to say no matter what. There are, you know what, just pray for them. Can't do anything else. Life's too short to be resentful. <laughs> um, let's see. Diana, I may not be the norm, but I see good parts in all the books I read. If people can write better, I ought to try writing one. Um, yes, I appreciate that too. You know, you can say what you liked or didn't like a book, but the process of what it takes to write a book is so, so much. You put so much into there. So to diss it just for no reason is, you know, it's hurtful. <laughs> Susan, you're so personable. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. It's, uh, it's just a beautiful day in Virginia. Out of a, out of, after a big storm last night, we were out of power for an hour in the middle of the night. And so we have sunshine. So it's... Uh, easy to feel sunshiny. Diana says the homeschool kids I know are very smart. Yes, I think colleges picked up on that. Colleges are very actively recruiting homeschooled students now. So I'm, I'm thankful I don't get the your kids must be stupid comments anymore. Um, let's see, Nancy, I think you answered my question about reading reviews. Good, I got that. Um, you guys are amazing. I love this. Let's see. Um, Jenny, I'll check out your you on YouTube. Yes, find me. I'm Camille DeMaio. It's really awesome that I have a unique name because I'm really not very hard to find. Um, Leslie, I'll subscribe to your YouTube. Thank you. So what I'm doing on there and I'm just starting next week. Oh, let me, yeah, let me tell you what I'm doing with YouTube. So like I said, I have my two minute book reviews up there about other people's books. I have my book trailers on there, which my brother has made for me. And so I, I love those. And uh, a few things are bookish news. Like I'll do a video of opening my box of books when it comes. But what I'm starting brand new is interviews. Now that this has forced me to learn how to use Zoom, I am going to initiate next week doing my first Zoom interviews. But I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm excited about this. There's a lot of author to author interviews out there. And those are great. I am definitely going to be doing those as well. But I think that books are about so much more than the authors. Books are about the readers. They're about the bookstagrammers. They're about the publicists, the editors, the booksellers. There's so many people involved. So I'm going to start doing a series of videos. I'm going to aim for once a week on my YouTube uh, channel where I'm going to talk to all the periphery people. Because as authors, we get to have our name on the front of the book, and that's really great. But really read the acknowledgments because that is the engine that has driven the author to be able to do it. And those are all the people who have made it happen and put them into readers' hands. So I want to know and I want to share all the people that support it. So I'm going to be reaching out to just some of my awesome readers as well. And um, I hope that you'll all be interested in that, just the process along the way. I feel like I'm going to learn a lot uh, through that. And um, so I hope that uh, you guys will too. Let's see. Oh, you guys are asking. Oh, I, I'm on the phone. I'm really trying to figure out how to get you the Paul McCartney pictures. Tell you what, if you go find me on Facebook, the Camille DeMaio author page, I will go after this and I will post my Paul McCartney pictures. I will have to dig a little bit to find my video, but I will put it over there after this so you can go find me over there. Anne-Marie says, sign up for Camille's newsletter because she's awesome. I look really awesome on my newsletter because Anne-Marie told me how to do it, <laughs> but thank you. So I put the link on there. Diana says, you've, you've been so busy, how do you relax? Um, I, th I do well being busy, but you know what? I believe very much in self-care. It's um, just kind of cliche, but you know, on an airline when they tell you to put your own oxygen mask on first before your child's um, or before somebody else's, it's so true. And what it is, is you have to be strong in order to give. You can't be wrung out in order to give. And I've given a lot of talks, to, especially to homeschool mom groups or mom groups in general, because I think as moms, 
we feel like we have to wring ourselves until there's nothing left and we have to give and give and give and then we we don't even know who we are anymore and we're stressed out and I don't think we're serving our children well by letting them see mom that way. So I really think that by prioritizing self-care, I love to take good baths. I'll go get a massage once a month. Nothing crazy, nothing expensive, but I will do, or even if it's just, I'll go sit on my balcony and read for an hour and I will tell them I am reading right now. I do those things for myself. I go to coffee with my friends and my kids see me prioritizing me. That doesn't mean it's me first, but it means that I will be better to you. I will be a better giver if my well is full. So um, I, I do stay busy, but I really prioritize taking care of me too. And hopefully that makes me a better giver. I think too, side note, that um, moms out there shouldn't feel guilty for those things or pursuing their hobbies or pursuing careers because your children are watching and they're seeing how you do it. And if you want them to explore all the many choices they have in the world, then they should see you exploring those choices too. I think that's the best teacher. Um, let's see, screenshot these both. Leslie, um, that would be great if I was more technologically advanced and if I knew how to close these down in order to put them up, but I will go put the Paul McCartney pictures on my Facebook page. Um, Linda is very generously giving out a few copies of the first Emma, so I'm seeing her um, comments there. Um, Leslie said, it's been a blessing to have you all. It is a blessing to me. Thank you guys so much. I, we're already at three o'clock. That just went so very fast. I'm just, feel free to, uh, if you just set aside the hour, feel free to log off. But I do want to definitely respect everybody who made a, a comment and a question. So I, I'm going to stay and finish those up. Uh, Mindy says, I like to make up my own mind about books and movies. And that answers my question about where you live. Yes, I live in... Uh, Williamsburg, Virginia. I said Virginia, but it's uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, um, quite close to Colonial Williamsburg. And uh, if the next question about that is going to be, am I ever going to write an 18th century book? Probably not. I don't think that that's so much in my wheelhouse, but I do love going into Colonial Williamsburg. I like 20th century. Uh, let's see. Jenny, I think I would enjoy your review of other authors' books. Yes. On my YouTube channel, I only review the books that I would give five stars because it's all a matter of taste. And so there might be something that in my mind, it might've been a three or four star to me, but I'm going to tell you about the ones I'm really enthusiastic about. So if you see a lot of enthusiastic reviews, that's genuine. It's not that I think every book is, is one that I'm that ecstatic about, but I will tell you about the ones that I am. I've just been slacking on it, but I'm starting that up again. Uh, let's see, Elisha, I've enjoyed the live chat. Thank you so much. You were so engaged and I appreciate that. Jenny says, I always read acknowledgements. Yes, it's so important. Antoinette's been good hearing you speak. Thank you for being here, Antoinette. Um, good, I think. Let's see. Mindy says, thank you so much. Zoom has been invaluable. Yes, it's forcing me to learn things that I am, you know, <laughs> cavemanning myself to learn these things. Um, let's see. I think I got through. Diana says, I constantly talk to my son about staying calm. Yes. When I learned I was, a preg I was pregnant with a boy after three girls, I was so scared because I knew nothing about boys. I remained calm, so intentionally calm in that pregnancy. And he, that kid is chill. I'd like to believe something, something in my calmness passed on to him that was so intentional. I see seashells in the background. Yes. I think uh, Diana just saw that. This is one of my seashell jars. This was primarily, these were all in Maine. Um, yeah, I think these were all seashells from Maine. Virginia's for lovers. Carla, great for being here. I'm at the end of this. Let's see. Carol, thank you for being here too. And Tracy, I love, says, I love Williamsburg and have my house decorated in the colonial Williams in, uh, in colonial period. Yes, Williamsburg is a very special place. Uh, we did move here from San Antonio. We were very intentional about what we were looking for. Um, and Williamsburg has met and exceeded every hope that we had for it. So it's a special place. It is opening up again. My husband and I are about to go on a date. Actually, after this, we're going to go get dinner because the weather's beautiful and you can eat at a restaurant outside right now. 
So that's where I'm heading next. They are out getting, the boys are getting haircuts because that's open again. So thank you. And I uh, pray for your health and safety as we continue to go through this. I thank Linda for the platform today and for all of you for uh, sharing an hour with me. Come find me on Instagram and YouTube and my newsletter primarily. And uh, if you ever have a question, I'm pretty easy to find and I'm pretty good about answering. All right. Love you all. Thank you.